Attempts at facial plastic surgery have occurred over many centuries. The first attempt at a rhinoplasty, better known as a nose job, was thought to have been carried out by a surgeon called Sushruta in 600 BC, placing the origins of plastic surgery in ancient India. Over the years, various techniques have been explored. Tagla Cozy in the 16th century popularised his own kind of rhinoplasty. A portion of skin was partially detached from the arm and then attached at one end to the nose. At the other end, it was still attached to the arm. The arm would be held in place and over a week later, the skin would be fully removed from the arm. It would then be moulded into a nose shape and fully attached to the other end of the nose. Both having the arm in place that long and having the surgery were extremely uncomfortable. Anaesthetic would not have been used and the chance of infection would have been high. Despite this, some people preferred this ordeal over wearing a brass nose, but some did prefer a brass nose instead. Deliberating on this option wasn't that uncommon in 16th century Italy. Having your nose chopped off by a sword was more common than you might think. For example, infamous astronomer Tycho Brahe lost his nose in a duel with a politician over a mathematics disagreement. Along with sword, syphilis also caused nose issues. Syphilis was a huge problem in 16th century Italy. In its later stages, syphilis can cause gummets, which are growths of tissue that damage healthy flesh, and can leave areas of the body looking disfigured. Tagle Cozy had to learn and improve his method which he had actually picked up from the Branca family. The Branca family previously used skin and muscle, but Tagle Cozy only used skin. This alteration made the procedure more successful and helped him meet the rising demand for rhinoplasties in Italy. The needs of the time changed the face of medical advancement, and never has that been more prominent in plastic surgery than in World War I. The Great War caused death and destruction the likes of which the world had never seen before. It also caused injuries of extreme severity and scale the likes of which the world had never seen before. This was due to the nature of its combat. The advancement of machine guns and heavy artillery meant one man in cover could take out many who were charging him on foot. This caused warfare to be pushed into the trenches. These provided more cover and survivability against the advanced weaponry, and even provided positions in which the weaponry could be used effectively. However, the trenches merely altered what weapons were favoured. At the beginning of the war, shrapnel shells were preferred. These could provide multiple points of damage on an individual from a distance. Shrapnel shells were extremely powerful against infantry on foot, but not so much when they were protected by a trench. Explosive shells then became more popular as trench warfare became prominent. Mortars were reintroduced, which had been virtually redundant in Europe prior to the war. However, all firearms remained effective to some capacity, and they all contributed to the rise of facial injuries. Because when you want to go up and out of a trench, when you want to take a sneak peek at the enemy, even when you're just walking around in the trenches, the most exposed part of your body is your head and face. The road from injury to recovery was also a brutal one. From trenches to first aid stations to overworked hospitals, wounded men were often left unattended for very long periods of time. Chances of infection were high due to the nature of the weaponry as well as the injuries, allowing for mud, debris and much more to infect a wound. Even if infection wasn't troubling a wounded soldier, many operations would often be required for the types of facial injuries surgeons were faced with. Today, modern plastic surgery focuses on the reconstruction of both function and normal appearance, as well as the cosmetic, which aims to improve on normal appearance. Before World War I, the cosmetic element of plastic surgery was probably not even considered, as returning a disfigured body part to normal appearance wasn't high on the priority list either. It was mostly about restoring function. This was especially true for medics working in field ambulances. They had to improvise on the job to keep soldiers alive with horrific facial injuries. One of these medics was Harold Gillies. Gillies was 32 at the time of the war's inception and was working as a surgeon in London. However, this did not prepare him for his time on the battlefield. Gillies stated, While students were weaned on small excisions of scars and cleft lips, we were suddenly being asked to produce half a face. This time serving for the British Army in Belgium and France gave him the opportunity to work under dentist Auguste Charles Valadier in the treatment of facial injuries. In Paris, Gillies also saw Dr. Morristin remove a tumour from a patient's face and replace the skin with skin from the patient's jaw. These experiences led Gillies to set up a special facial wounds ward in the Cambridge Military Hospital in Aldershot. Gillies had seen the medical benefits of early plastic surgery, but really wanted to focus on and improve current techniques. He wanted to restore patients to normal appearance which wasn't previously valued within the field of plastic surgery because it was still a niche discipline at the time. For example, Otto Lanz pioneered the mesh skin graft and shared it with the world in 1908 before Gillies became involved. 
This was a skin graft technique which allowed less skin to cover more area. However, this technique went largely unused by Allied forces as Land's teachings were not printed in English until 1972. Due to the niche nature of plastic surgery at the time, Gillies printed labels which said Facio Maxillary Injury, Cambridge Hospital, Aldershot, and sent them to casualty stations in France for the wounded to wear. He was worried his ward would have very few patients otherwise, and was hoping to get about 200 soldiers to fill up his ward. He ended up getting 2,000. Clearly Gillies needed more resources, and he therefore started the first ever hospital dedicated purely to facial injuries in 1917. This was called the Queen's Hospital. The hospital's only aim was to reconstruct wounded faces as fully as possible. Due to the hospital's very specific area in medical care, the hospital had some very unique guidelines. Mirrors were banned to prevent patients being horrified by their own faces, and some outside benches were painted blue to warn townspeople that a man sat on this bench would be distressful to look at. The psychological effect these injuries had on soldiers were unimaginable, and Gillies knew this. People would look at them differently, they'd be a stranger to their families, and they'd be a stranger to themselves. This made Gillies' work all the more important, not only in the development of his hospital, but also in the development of his techniques. Probably the single most important medical advancement in plastic surgery that Harold Gillies made was the tubed pedicle. Tagler Cozy's method was revolutionary for the time. Keeping the skin attached to the arm meant blood supply was maintained to the skin being grafted. However, rate of infection was high due to the bottom side of the skin being exposed. Gillies' tube pedicle was a solution. By wrapping the skin into a tube, chance of infection was reduced massively, and blood supply was still maintained at the donor site. This also didn't have to be between the arm and the nose. Many different areas of skin could be attached to almost any area on the face. This tubed technique was a huge advancement in plastic surgery, and the healthy nature of this skin graft meant some of the results were truly incredible for its time. To me, the tubes look like something out of a sci-fi alien horror film, which may have contributed to the rule on mirrors. But the end outcome of the tube pedicle is all that really matters. Walter Yeo was the first man to receive the tube pedicle. Walter was a battleship gunner who sustained significant facial injuries, most notably the loss of both eyelids. Therefore, restoring functionality and Walter being able to close his eyes was Gilly's main priority. As you can see, a large flap of skin was placed over the eyes, and this was attached by tubed skin on both sides. Walter's tube pedicle had a few complications and required multiple surgeries, but was eventually a success. In fact, Walter Yeo lived all the way to 1960 to the age of 70. The tubed pedicle became a staple procedure of the Queen's Hospital and Harold's medical repertoire. But this wasn't the only advancement made in facial reconstruction during World War I. The man who had inspired Gillies to pursue facial plastic surgery after observing one of his operations, Hippolyte Morstin, was also at the forefront of medical advancement in facial reconstruction. Most notably, Morstin popularised the fat graft, where fat was transplanted from a specific part of the body to an injured part of the face. Multiple fat graft procedures were developed by Morstin, which all aimed to fill substance loss caused by injury or after a reconstruction. The primary objective was to increase the volume of the face, but it also had positive effects on skin healing and reduced scar tissue. Although this was not known at the time, this skin healing effect was due to the positive regeneration properties of stem cells in body fat. Unsurprisingly, this made pairing fat grafts with a tube pedicle very successful, and Gillies used Morstein's fat graft in the Queen's Hospital. Gillies' other main inspiration, Valadier, was credited as the first dentist specialist to serve in the British Army during World War I. The half-French, half-American dentist was involved in the life-saving treatment of a high-ranking British officer. This led to the realisation of just how vital dentists would be in the treatment of mouth and jaw injuries. An influx of dentists in the army soon followed, as the complexity of the mouth and jaw required a significantly more specialised knowledge than the rest of the face. However, when reconstructing any part of the structure of the face, similar types of grafts were used. A bone graft was used to transplant bone from a healthy region to a damaged region. This was a technique Valadier experimented with to a high success. Cartilage grafts and prosthetic replacements were also used in reconstructing bone structure. Here you can see how Gillies used a prosthetic replacement to reconstruct the structure of this soldier's nose. And here you can see a soldier who has had ear cartilage grafted to the bottom of his cheek and his own tube pedicle embedded into his cheek to raise the position of the eye. 
This is William Spreckley, who Gillies also treated. To reconstruct his nose, Gillies removed some cartilage from Spreckley's ribcage, cut it into an arrow shape, and implanted it into his forehead for six months. This was to establish a healthy graft location, which Gillies then lifted and attached to the nose area. Further surgeries occurred to improve appearance and function, and the end results were so impressive that this particular patient's surgery is documented as being hugely significant in the advancement of rhinoplasties and nasal reconstruction. All this work meant in later years, it's not immediately apparent that Spreckley has even received such extensive work on his face. This result, as well as so many others at the time, were very impressive considering these procedures were being invented, learned, experimented with, and optimised in just a few short years. Despite this, Spreckley was mocked by other soldiers for having such a big nose after the initial surgery. Further surgeries resolved this, but even in the later years, William's granddaughter reported that all his life he still thought he looked hideous. The psychological scars of these injuries meant that when facial reconstruction couldn't restore normal appearance adequately, something had to be done. Francis de Wentwood was a talented artist and sculptor who began World War I by joining London General Hospital. After initially being tasked with remedial work, it was found that his previous experience in sculpting made him a natural in working on splints, being able to craft them in a more sophisticated way to better fit limbs. This newfound use for his talent allowed Wood to open a brand new unit in the hospital in 1916. This was called the Mass for Facial Disfigurement Department, better known as the Tin Nose Shop. Here he developed a lightweight metallic mask which would resemble the pre-injured face of defigured soldiers. After all that could be done through surgery was completed, a plaster cast of the face was taken to reflect the healed face and missing or injured features. Over weeks Wood would use this plaster cast to shape a copper mask, and would then paint it, taking into consideration the soldier's pigmentation and major features like eyes and eyebrows. His masks were a huge success and inspired others to emulate Wood's work, including American sculptor Anna Ladd, who opened the infamous studio for portrait masks in Paris. Talking about his work, Wood stated, My cases are generally extreme ones that plastic surgery is abandoned, but as in plastic surgery the psychological effects are the same. The patient acquires his old self-respect, self-assurance, self-reliance, and takes once more to a pride in his personal appearance. His presence is no longer a source of melancholy to himself, nor of sadness to his relatives and friends. Soon after the war, the tin nose shop closed as facial injuries drastically declined in frequency. The need for facial plastic surgery also declined, but the advancements made in World War I by Gillies, Morstein, Valadier, and countless others cannot be overstated. Without their immense effort, innovation, and willingness to tackle many significant facial injuries, medical knowledge would not be what it is today. Thanks for watching. My channel is changing, so if you want to know what I'm doing and why, there's a video on my second channel explaining what's going on. Please like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time.